Welcome to When We're Not Hustling, a podcast where sex workers talk about everything but. I'm your host, Jesse Sage. Put away the lingerie. I want to know you. Tell me more. I don't care about the news. I want to hear about you and see the world from your point of view the coffee's already made so i'll part the shades just pull up a chair and tell me more when we're not hustling is a weekly podcast that explores the lives and identities of sex workers outside of our work personas, our personal philosophies, ambitions, families, relationships, passions, spirituality, and so much more. We talk about our lives beyond the job, asking what does the flexibility of sex work allow us to do and who does it allow us to be? On this show, we learn who sex workers are outside of the work we're known for. When We're Not Hustling is an exploration of the people behind the fantasies. When We're Not Hustling is brought to you by Assembly 4. Assembly 4 is a collective of sex workers and technologists working to bring the overall cost of sex work down through their advertising platform, Trist.link. They also educate clients through the Good Client Guide and provide resources and articles written by and for sex workers. Assembly 4 caters to all genders and demographics and raises funds to fight for sex worker rights and against exploitation in the sex industry. Learn more at assembly4.com. A-S-S-E-M-B-L-Y-F-O-U-R.com. Hi, this is Jesse Sage, and welcome back to another episode of When We're Not Hustling. This is episode 10, so we are moving right along. I'm really excited by all the guests that we've had, and that's true of the one we have today, too. Who is Seska? Seska has been in the industry for 25 years, and today we're going to be talking about aging and sexuality and longevity in the industry and how to understand our changing bodies as we grow and age. And that, you know, as somebody who's just turned 46, um, it was really, really nice for me to talk to somebody who is a little bit further along than I am about how they're managing their, their, their lives and their bodies. So I think you'll also enjoy it. Before we get into that, I wanted to remind you that there are many ways that you can support us. One of them is by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcast and Spotify. You can just look us up as when we're not hustling wherever you listen to us. Another thing that you can do that would be great is we do have a Patreon and you can throw in a couple dollars a month to support us. I mean, we're putting a ton of work into these episodes and that would be amazing. I post this podcast there, also my column, my Pittsburgh City Paper column, and some photo sets and other interviews and things I'm working on. You can find that at patreon.com backslash backslash. (laughs) I think that's right. Patreon.com backslash sapio textual. Also, I mean, I want to thank everybody who's been following us so far and leaving us comments about what they like about the episodes that we've had so far. That's been lovely to get all of the feedback. We're 10 episodes in. Um, trying to get this whole thing up off the ground. And that takes a lot of effort. So anything that you can do to support us would be great. I also want to say that if you're a sex worker and you want to appear on the show and talk to us about what you're into, what you do in your time where you're not working, what you care about, what you love, anything that's not sex work itself, uh, please send us an email and let us know. Our email address is nothustlingpod at proton.me. All right, so let's introduce Seska. Seska is a content creator, performer, writer, and educator. She worked in the field of adult entertainment since 1998. Her mission is to explore, document, and share her sexuality as she ages. She began as a 27-year-old girl next door, and now she's a 53-year-old modern-day cougar. Passionate about aging and pleasure, Seska has been making content around the menopause transition. Seska is also a sex worker rights activist and speaks on panels, universities, and public health organizations about the impacts or stigmatization and criminalization, as well as topics of resilience and longevity and sex work. So let's turn to our interview with Seska. 
Hi, Saska. It's so nice to see you today. Hi, it's great to see you too. How have you been? I'm good. I'm good. I feel like I've had a nice start to this 2024. Oh, that's nice. It's like, like smooth. Just that's smooth. That's nice. Nothing too exciting <laughs> and nothing too dull. Just movement. It is flying by a little bit though. So yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, we're almost in March. Yes. And where I live, we've had an unseasonably warm and unsnowy winter. Uh huh. And so I think it's confusing me a bit too, yeah. because it's starting to be spring-like a little early. Not mm-hmm. complaining, but definitely a bit, a bit weird. I'm always looking at my like landmarks when I travel in uh-huh. life, but and a, as like a like a passenger in a car, and I feel I'm doing the same thing in my year. Like, what is going on? What yeah. am I? What 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 are my la- um, landmarks? And right yeah. now the landmark <laughs> is spring, but it's February. So mm. I know it's like that here too. It's really nice outside right now. And I'm in Pittsburgh, and we usually have snow in February. And There has been a little bit, but not much. And it's nice because I'm a warm weather. Like I like spring and fall. I'm, I like living in a place that has seasons. I don't like the extremes as much, but like, I like the cyclical nature of it. So on a personal level, I'm like, oh, this is nice on a larger scale. I'm like, this is a little terrifying. (laughs) These drastic changes in weather are a little terrifying. It, it definitely it, it fills up the mind a bit. Yeah, yeah. So are you going to be at, this is a side note, but are you going to be at Expiz Miami in May? I am. I okay. am. So I'm all booked. And I'm going to actually be in Fort, I decided to fly a few days late early. Oh, nice. A little bit less expensive to be in Fort Lauderdale. So I... Um, I always I'm fly to Fort go. Lauderdale too, because it's less expensive yeah. to fly there. And it's not further yeah. than the Miami airport, really. Yeah, so I'm flying there. And I have a rental so that I'm going to just ease into uh, the week. So I'll be gone. Oh. I'll be because like, I feel like That's it's a really short nice. show. Yeah. So I'm mm-hmm. going to do that. And I, I feel like it's easier. You kind of want to leave after yeah. a conference versus um, stay after. You're kind of. Burned at least out. that's for me. I, I at yeah. least I'm trying it this time. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. I think PJ and I are going to go too. So I haven't booked yet. Although I have to say it's so funny because I, since I don't do content creation anymore for a long time, we were going with like under press. And since Peep Show ended, I put in the registration to get like a code to register for it, and they're like there must be turnover because the person who wrote me back was like, can you tell me a little bit more about your business? And I was like, excuse me, I've been there like seven years in a row. Okay. They did do a hire. (laughs) I noticed at XBiz LA because I bumped into, and you can kind of tell when someone works for XBiz, they're very friendly in the elevator in a way that (laughs) they're like, how's the show? How's the show for you? Yeah. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, this person works for that person. I mean, for the, and and it was her first show. So I think, Okay, she yeah, because I was a little bit right offended. After. Like, you don't know who I am. <laughs> yeah, I've been to this show like I seven years she, in a row. I thought she was someone else uh-huh. entirely. And then when I talked to my friend, it was like, you know, that person doesn't look anything like the person you think. I'm like, I know. I just, now I, I like it. I made, it made sense, but um, it, they were in the same role as the person. So I, uh, I my brain uh-huh. did, my brain did a swap. A, you know, <laughs> okay. switcheroo. That's good to know. So I am not registered yeah. yet, but I am in the process of doing that. And we're planning on being there. So it'll be nice to see you again. It'll be good to see you too. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to have you on the show to talk about aging. I know that's something that you've been um, pretty outspoken about in terms of your business and in some of your writing. And um, I would love to talk to you about that, especially as somebody who for uh, in the uh, in the grand scheme of things, I'm on the older side too of people working in this industry. So I uh, wanted to start with like you've been you've been in the industry for many many years, huh? Twenty or so. Uh, so since 1998. So I celebrated 25 years this past November. Wow. And yes, yeah, so I was in the early adopter phase of mm-hmm. the personal pay site. It was not a doctor. It was like creator, like the yeah. early, <laughs> okay. we weren't adopting anything. We, we were, you know, mixing and matching what was available. And then, um, especially the tech side of things, people yeah. having to do everything themselves. So 
I come from that era and I've gone through ups and downs of the 2000s. In mm-hmm. 2010, I did retire from on camera and I became more of a sex blogger as well as wellness, health, aging. I was going mm-hmm. on a midlife crisis journey and I documented <laughs> it for okay. better or for worse because I did delete my my Twitter. Uh-huh. But I had a lot of drunk tweets that <laughs> I used as practically therapy of that midlife crisis. Okay. And it was, I, You're I was sober vague. now, aren't you? Yes. I have 10 years of sobriety, but I remember wow. vague posting on purpose, like practically trying to make little poems about like my, <laughs> my suffering. And I was suffering. Yeah, I was, yeah. I was very, I was deeply unhappy and uh, very, not emotionally regulated. And mm-hmm. as very few people are when they're <laughs> drinking alcohol. <laughs> Uh, did it help? Did did the like blogging that you did and the video yes, posting help? Yes, because it was good to document and get some perspective once I was sober, mm. once I was like maybe three months down the road to look at these things. And I also always looked at it with curiosity and kindness. I'm mm. not Buddhist, but I've certainly uh, been, you know, have read some Buddhist texts and yeah. some mindfulness texts. So that shows it's really a lot about self-compassion. So you can have my word of like that. I've been seeking the thing I've been seeking all my life, which is equanimity Mm, and just mm -hmm. being able to regulate and, and ride the waves of life. Yeah. Not try to control those waves, ride those waves. And so that's actually a very hard thing to do. That takes a lot of conscious effort, conscious effort, mistakes. Yeah. Uh, and kindness when you feel ashamed and humiliated and embarrassed for mm-hmm. emotional outbursts or saying the wrong thing to the wrong person. Yeah. And then you're, I would always say, I want to throw myself under a bus every time, like I would misspeak and hurt someone's feelings. Yeah. Or like, I really took it personally. One of the things was, I haven't done much uh, of the, the big book AA, I've done some wasn't hundred percent for me, but I did take a lot of mm-hmm. the things that I, you know, I did benefit from it. And one of the things is to talk about the, the ego of the alcoholic and, mm-hmm. and, and how you were, there's a self-centeredness about your pain. And I was, I had delusions of grandeur. I thought I was the worst person in the world. Yeah. It's interesting. I've heard so many women say that, that like AA is very much like centered around like male ego. And that when they went in trying to like make amends is actually something that doesn't, isn't helpful when you already take responsibility for everything that there's like right almost a reverse psychology where it's like, this isn't helpful to me. I already feel bad. And I already over apologize for things I have have no control over. So um, it almost actually does the, it has like the opposite impact where it just, it, yeah. It's not a useful exercise necessarily. I have made amends with my dearest friends mm-hmm. and over, the, and it wasn't, they weren't formal, but I would be in a moment where I would go, I feel, I need to let them know that I apologize for gossiping behind their back, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. And uh, I was in burlesque and there's a lot of gossip and mm-hmm. there's oh, a yeah. lot of alcohol <laughs> and everyone, yeah. there's very little sobriety, even like just within a show. So a lot of people hurt each other's feelings and took up too much space or, mm-hmm. you know, didn't communicate well. And, and sometimes it was, there was cruelty. Yeah. And so th- but those were really healing conversations and but I feel like they weren't part of the formal, li- you know, I did make yeah. my list mm-hmm. and things and they were mm-hmm. useful, but I got much m- more support from therapy. I did talk therapy yeah, uh, before I got sober and she allowed me to come to, to my therapist allowed me to come to the point of becoming sober. Mm-hmm. And um, I bring, I, I like talking about this, but it also is in reference to age because there is a journey of alcohol that happens often with women and mm-hmm. age and an, a physical intolerance that happens in late Mm. thirties and Mm forties. It really is. And it's a hormonal shift. So of course our body's not going to be able to process and metabolize things the same. We're going through a radical, radical change, the change. And so alcohol definitely was poisoning me, my body, but I think, and then of course my, my relationships and my ability to be yeah. good to myself and others so yeah and present and right. so it's definitely part of my aging story 
And one of the books that I highly recommend, it's by a Canadian author called Drink. I can't remember the author's name, okay. but she's a Canadian uh-huh. author. But so, so it would have come out around when I got sober 2013. Um, mm-hmm. And it's all, it's a memoir of her story of alcohol, her mother's, her experience of her mother's alcohol okay. problems and the data on sobriety and alcohol and women. And because it's not studied and yeah. mm-hmm. there's been a shift of mommy wine culture yeah, and that kind of marketing that has made either alcohol misuse yeah. and mm-hmm. abuse. It, it's just like normalized within the culture. Yes. And yeah. so, and it, and it is really about sort of appeasing a distress and stress in, in, in and it's a coping mechanism, but it is a damaging yeah. coping mm-hmm, mechanism, mm-hmm. mechanism for most. And so this book was really useful. And the way I found it, I had the worst Christmas. I was, you know, wasted. I was just, just an, like a mess. And mm-hmm. I knew things, I had tried to get sober one year and a half before that. And I was like, oh, this, I, I was having a bad December. Yeah. And I ended up going, I had like a gift card for the bookstore from Christmas. Mm-hmm. So I went on the 27th and I was like, look, I was going to go buy a cookbook. Mm-hmm. And then I'm in the cookbook section and this book about alcoholism and drinking and not just alcohol, but just drinking yeah, but and drinking was there. And I was like, I'm going to buy this book. Yeah, really? And that book helped me get yeah. through the first three days alone mm-hmm. and made the decision. And then I did go to my first meeting which was a like a young person's meeting. And it turns out there was tons of like people from the cabaret burlesque scene and the queer oh scene. Gosh. It was a very <laughs> yeah. queer oriented group. Yeah. And everyone was having a rough time because holidays are rough. Yeah. And I was, to, and then it was great. It was really good. Mm-hmm. It was a good introduction to community and not feeling alone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And not being embarrassed for being a hot mess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I was like, oh, that's why you are in this world and you're not a hot mess in the burlesque world. Yeah. <laughs> but because it wasn't because this yeah. particular person in, in that I'm remembering was not out really, you know, like it was just yeah. live by example, which is I think it is a good uh, yeah. be a role like, model. Didn't, and get, didn't and like it, talk much about being sober, like in the spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. would always, you know, have a different kind of beverage and and then it, it became clear that, yes, it's true. It's the attraction of having a, 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 a living a healthier life means that it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. To do that and to make changes and to adjust and be flexible. So what and, did it, what did sobriety or what did that journey like give to you? How did it change your life? Saved my life. Saved yeah. my life. I, I, I was in. I was in a really dark place when I ended my marriage when I was uh, 39 and that led to more drinking. I was Mm. drinking a lot near the end. How long were you married? I was with him for close to 17 years and we were married about uh, 10 and a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So I left the marriage that long in my 19 years, like together, 17 years married at 36. So I was like in my late thirties too. And I, did that. And it's a transformative experience. I think so. And I've talked to more uh, people um, through my TikTok, where we Mm -hmm. talk about next chapters. And basically, I talk about aging and pleasure, but I'm realizing there are some men that come into my lives who are saying, I'm divorced, I don't know how to date. And Mm -hmm. I don't know what I want. And I think just making space for the I don't know, is really useful. Because you don't have to decide today. You don't right, have to right. you can change your mind. You can yeah. change your mind about dating <laughs> and who you want to date. Yeah. You mm-hmm. Not a, a, and yeah, and how you want to form relationships and how intimate you want to be or not. And so right. uh, mm-hmm. I am finding that's sort of happening. It's a midlife. It's midlife for a lot of people, not just women, but yeah. I think it's heavily with women because we have the ability now to have more financial freedom and independence right. and power, right. financial power. So we can leave relationships yeah, that are I, not working. It's, it's interesting because that like mid to late thirties period, I feel like I've had other friends who are like questioning everything about their life and their marriage. And like, I just thinking about like leaving and almost every time when I'm like, well, how old are you right now? They're like, Oh, somewhere between 35 and 40. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds about right. It's like when you come into your, like, I'm not anti-marriage, but I think it's like when you come into your own, 
it's hard to maintain the relationships that you started when you were very young. There's a lot that goes on and change between 20s, 30s to 40s. Mm-hmm. I think also there's so many reasons we have a uh, a story for what a marriage is mm-hmm. culturally, family culture, yeah. larger culture, um, your com- your you know ethnic community and culture of that you know, and then yeah. just the big Disney World that we live in. Yeah. And happy endings. I thought marriage was going to give me equanimity. I thought Mm -hmm. it was going to give me adulthood. I got married when I was 28, 27, 28. Mm -hmm. um, But I was with him from 22. But I really thought, okay, now I'm an adult. I'm living with him. Yeah. And we're, you know, we have careers and we're building towards something. And we were on the same page in many, many ways Mm -hmm. and, um, and suited each other very well. But then as, our worlds were changing. We mm-hmm. no longer were. And yeah, I was deeply dissatisfied and disillusioned mm-hmm. and disappointed. And I didn't communicate that well necessarily. Yeah. Or he didn't, we, neither of us did. Let's yeah. be honest. I think mm-hmm. um, he was quite content with how things were, but I was not. Yeah. yeah. And so he was getting his needs and wants met and I wasn't. Right. Mm-hmm. And it was my fault that I wasn't in his eyes a lot of the time. Yeah. I was going to say, do you actually think that (laughs) he thought that? Yeah. Yeah. He thought, he thought, no, this is good. And he was like, if you want something different, you should just do it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, it takes two. Um, Mm -hmm. Because then I did start doing it. And then I realized I'm quite happy doing my emotional labor. I'm quite, I'm, I mean, I, I did get very sloppy and sad with it, uh, with the drunkenness. Um, and I had to, do a drastic reboot with the sobriety. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did all the work to get me to sobriety. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. I was able to really thrive. Yeah. I thrive now. I'm I'm in a place of thriving. I'm present with my yeah. loved ones. Mm-hmm. I have capacity. I love using that word. Yeah. Yeah. And I did not have capacity when I was drunk for sure. Yeah. <laughs> now I have capacity to meet the challenges that come. Yeah. And now I'm, I, especially like now in my late 40s and now 50s, but it's been, I took care of my mother and I really mm-hmm. showed up for her. And yeah. we had a healing journey with her um, during COVID. We lived together and she got cancer. I got cancer and we were there for each other. Yeah. And I also was accepting when she wasn't there for me mm-hmm. because she was way further along in her life. Yeah. For her to radically change and really give me what I needed as her child. Yeah. I'd come to terms that she was not actually going to give me, even when I asked for it, it would, yeah. it wasn't, she, she, she was a different generation and a different, yeah. Yeah. Um, a different person. And she had, we had lifelong habits. So mm-hmm. through therapy, I did a ton of work about my relationship with my mother and I was able through that therapy and through sobriety, be there for her. Yeah. And that's really special, actually, huh? She started to meet me where I was and yeah. I met her where she was. Yeah. And she had her, like, I wish she could have listened to your conversation with your mother because mm. she, oh, I'm going to get emotional. My mom made great strides in acceptance yeah. of me and the industry and the activism and my friendships and yeah. what it, and the role it plays in my life. Yeah. It was a huge gift she gave me. But yeah. we, worked, we both worked for that gift. That didn't yeah. just... That was a magical. Yeah, right. That's what I tried to get across in that show with my mom. It's like, that was not easy. Like we struggled, like we really struggled to get to a place where we could even like talk about it at all. Yes. Yeah. And then it's got so many um, layers of of generational difference Mm -hmm. of uh, perhaps also orientation and relationship yeah. models that of different values and ways to experience it. and then just womanhood what does yeah. it mean to for her womanhood my you know yeah that's a lot mm-hmm. and and now um i have like it's been a challenge with my sister mm-hmm. uh as well she we ended up having like a triangle situation so my mom would talk to my sister about me i talked mm-hmm. to my sister my mom about my sister we both talked about yeah we very, very rarely had three way conversations or direct right. things and it is it just and you it, and your we, sister or it's just the two of you yes okay. yeah and my sister carried the burden of my mother's shame about my work mm. and and her her it wasn't vitriol but her like 
intense emotions about being ashamed and disappointed in me yeah at at the time so yeah my mom had really intense emotions too like really really struggled and I don't know what she said to my sisters about it but like I you know I'm not because I have three sisters and I'm not sure but yeah I I can see that I can see how that would happen and she she would take it as a badge of honor that she never told anyone and she never confided anyone and then now I'm very out with with the extended family now that my mom has passed they knew what I was doing no one would talk about it yeah and so but that was a choice she made not to confess or Mm, not you know not to to, to, yeah but like not to unburden or express with anyone and her friends loved her and I got to see it at her yeah. memorial. They loved her. They would have been understanding and supportive and yeah. not judged her. So she lost out on that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And see, did, her like, age, did you think that she felt like she was protecting you by not telling anyone? I was so out and I'm so like determined. No, yeah. she was protecting her own reputation. Yeah. Or she yeah. thought she was. I yeah. think so. Because she, what I realized in reflecting, she used to talk poorly when we, she goes, you know, her daughter's a dancer. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So she realized, she probably realized that she spoke badly and gossipy. So she now realized people were going to be gossiping about yeah. me and her. And they yeah. were. <laughs> but at the end of the day, yeah. the end of the day. Yeah. I I was working with age like within my own agency, my own integrity, mm-hmm. and 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 not always well, not gracefully. Yeah. It was messy, but now mm-hmm. now more and more, I'm. It's easier for me to uh, admit mistakes. Yeah, course mm-hmm. correct. See the mistake before it happens a little bit too. Yeah, yeah. Um, Do you feel like that is a product of aging? I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think you you realize the sun will come up mm, again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And not that it's a brand new day with no, you know, but there is there are cycles in life, there's cycles yeah. in the seasons and mm-hmm. uh giving grace, giving yourself right. grace and giving the opportunity. And then if someone cannot meet you with the course correction or yeah. or a, a, a mature saying this isn't working this yeah whatever it is could it be personal or professional Mm -hmm. Um, yeah it's easier I find it's easier yeah 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 I think that that's that's interesting because I I think that too like the older that I get the easier well going back to your idea of equanimity I mean the easier it is to stay more central because you do realize, you know, if you feel really bad that you've had other experiences in which you feel really bad and you come up on the other side of that. And the more times it's, you experience that, I think the easier it is to to think the sun will come up again and the world isn't going to crumble right here. <laughs> and I um will get through this. And feelings don't just as joy doesn't last forever, neither mm-hmm. does pain and suffering. There will be now, of course, some people have a little bit more either mood swings of a Mm -hmm. natural, like they're just more reactive to their environment Mm -hmm. and, and they have, they tell themselves more like hateful stories about themselves. So they're going to live in the, in the icky, gross feelings longer. Right. Um, But I have a toolbox that I've been building. It was a really wonka do. I realized I've been working on that toolbox since I was 10. Mm. Uh, since what I started, you, what do you feel a, like is in that toolbox? The toolbox is this is the newer tools are I'll get back to you. Mm, mm-hmm. I don't have to answer right away. Usually yeah. I panic and 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 then regret saying something. So uh that's a big one. Yeah. And before I used to think the the, the toolbox was more the superficials, like, well, if I get my period, I'm going to be a woman and I'm gonna feel great. Like they were more ideas, yeah, they were concepts, mm-hmm. and then of course they never worked out. If I get a boyfriend, <laughs> you know, then mm-hmm, I'll, you mm-hmm, know, I mm-hmm. will. Was funny at first. I was like, I'll get a boyfriend, and I'll be just like the books. And then we read <laughs> Sweet Valley High, but I read those oh, yeah. ones, you know. Mm-hmm. And I definitely was like, and then I will, uh, you know, just feel good, and I'll just yeah. get on to the new college. Will be great, and uh, mm-hmm. if I get these things, so I was definitely looking outside, right, for 
my to to build a foundation of of identity yeah, and right. strategy mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then deeply disappointed in that that never worked out um yeah. and one of my things was i thought my mom thought i wanted to be popular <laughs> we were actually she was my only friend other than like a, a friend who was at a different school and college mm-hmm. so we didn't see each other very much uh she was my only friend when I was about 19, 18, mm-hmm. 19. Like we went to concerts together because I had no one to go to. Mm-hmm. And then she goes, you wanted to be popular. I was like, no, mama, <laughs> I wanted a friend and I needed, yeah. I'm glad yeah. you were there for me, but I had no friends. I had a boyfriend, mm-hmm. but he wasn't a good friend. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, th- well, the toolbox, um, certain routines, routine mm-hmm. is helpful for me. And stacking routine is helpful for me and mm-hmm. my emotional uh, ability. So I, and some of that is food oriented. And then mm. some of it is uh, having ritual as well, which is different mm-hmm. than routine and working on self speak a lot. Mm-hmm. I have tools of journaling. I yeah. do think a lot of things are therapeutic, but they are not therapy. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm seeing the difference has been really helpful. Yeah. Because sometimes you think running is my therapy. Yeah. I'm like, no, running is therapeutic. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. But it's therapy is, it has it's to have different. many, many yeah. things. Mm-hmm. And I do think it, it's helpful to have a guide on that journey. Yeah. Of, mm-hmm. of therapy to true, like really, I yes, you can kind of work out with a coach, but when you want to do a very specific athletic task or in my case now I have early osteoporosis so I wanted like I need some really Mm -hmm. specific strength building and I need accountability so I have a after this meeting I'm going to see I have a 30 minute session and we do very specific things for my bones and my muscles Thank you for listening to When We're Not Hustling. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you listen to your podcasts. Doing so will help other people find us. And if you're a sex worker who wants to come on the show and talk about your life outside of work, we would love to have you. Please send an email with more information to nothustlingpod at proton.me. Yeah. When did that develop? So after my hysterectomy, I had a total hysterectomy because of my endometrial cancer, lost the mm-hmm. ovaries. And within a year, I had a lot of stuff. Like I went through 10 yeah, how years. How long of, ago was your surgery? It was, uh, the surgery was December 6th in 2022. Okay. Mm-hmm. So the first year, I, my menop- like the menopause went, like the perimenopause went to straight postmenopause and very quickly. Yeah. Usually your estrogen is a gradual reduction mm-hmm. if you don't have any interventions. Right. So you don't flip on a switch of like early osteoporosis or heart issues yeah. or those things. It's kind of like a gradual over 10 years if you're not having any HRT, yeah. which I wasn't. Um, I'm going to be looking into that and I hope I'm a good candidate. I'm, I'm a, I, it seems that I am, but I need mm-hmm. to, I have an appointment with a gynecologist my family doctor didn't feel, what do you need to um, be a good um candidate for that so um the fact that my cancer was caught early and it was really specific to uh my endometrial lining i don't also mm. um they are now seeing that very low levels of intervention aren't likely to cause breast cancer mm. um th- that was really sh- some bad research that was done uh, about 20 years ago that really did a disservice to a generation of menopausal oh, women. The like boomers what kind got, of innovation? Like, like you, you just, mean- you, they, yeah, no, they just got rid of HRT altogether. So oh, that's, okay. can, we're seeing increased heart disease, osteoporosis, and dementia wow. in people who did not have access. Estrogen is an extremely protective hormone of all cells. Yeah. So, um, now there's some much better research of uh, and showing which mm-hmm. doses, what combinations yeah. uh, with progesterone. I don't need progesterone, for example, because I don't have a uterus. Progesterone yeah. protects, limits the, the buildup of the uterine lining and allows oh, for shedding. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was really what caused my cancer is I was having very low progesterone. I had been using a Mirena IUD, which gives out a, a dose. And then during COVID, 
wasn't having any, I didn't need birth control and I was starting to spot. So I thought, oh, I'll take this out, see where I am. Mm -hmm. And then I had, that's where like the, the, the tumor grew like practically wow. overnight. I have a Mirena IUD. Is that something that's like that's protective uh, of your uterus? Okay. And if mm-hmm. you are, and if you enjoy it, I highly keep it. Yeah. For as long I've as I've had that. Yeah, I've. I think altogether, I've probably had Mirena IUDs for almost twenty years. Like I've yes, just taken them out to have a baby and then put it right back in. <laughs> yes, and yeah. so. I've known people who don't react well to it and then other people who just love it. And if it's the one for you, it's very protective. It gives yeah. you just a little bit of progesterone to keep the uterine lining hot, you know, well, and your estrogen will eventually start to dip in your early fifties, depending yeah. where you are in the perimenopause. And then you might need a change. And, yeah. but as long as you have your uterus, you will always need to, if you do choose hormone replacement therapy, you will need a form of progesterone. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and not the ones that you find in a yam or a <laughs> supplement. It cannot, it, it, yeah. that's, that's just expensive pee. Yeah. And I can go on record for that, even though I'm not a doctor, <laughs> we know that it just does not trans, it just doesn't, Yeah. it doesn't, you can't eat progesterone. You can't, mm. you can't, yeah. it just, it doesn't, it just doesn't work that way. Um, you can eat some phytoestrogen, but even then those are, um, very, very gentle, very subtle mm. little locks onto your estrogen receptors. They're, they're just like little, little babies, little tiny, little like <laughs> yeah, so, versions of estrogen. So what was the, what was the impact on you when you had your uterus taken out? Um, and you went into menopause so quickly. So I was prior to that, I was having d- incredible flooding. So that was really interfering with my webcam work and yeah. would have made it made in if I did in person. And I mean, like, or partnered work would have been impossible yeah. because the amount of sponges and everything. And yeah. I was with camming, I was able to do things while wearing a tampon and mm-hmm. then changing it every hour. Um, That's so with hard pleasure, though. With like pleasure, that makes it so much with orgasm, I would expel, yeah. right? And one time I did, and luckily I was below the camera. So it just mm-hmm. went all over the floor because it moved through everything. And wow. it was with my most regular, regular of regulars. So he was very, very understanding. Yeah. But for the cam network, if they had seen that, they would have banned me right away. Yeah. And I think it was what a, a lot of people, natural thing. Yeah. And I think what a lot of people don't know about the, industry is that it's against the rules to have menstruation and any porn, any videos on cam. And that's because the um, credit card companies determined that. They determine that they see it as blood. And Mm -hmm. um, and even though we all have read that orgasms help with pain, right, and menstrual pain. And so it is a part of a, a reproductive experience and a sexual experience if yeah. you have a uterus. And so it's it's like there's very natural things right. that aren't allowed and right. very like pause, sex positive things. Yeah. When I allowed. used to so, have periods and I don't because I've had Marina so much, like I liked having sex when I was on my period. It did make me feel better. It's, it's very useful. There's yeah. also just... Um, a relaxation that is happening a little bit because mm-hmm. of the opening of the of the cervix, which some people find very cramping, but other parts it's like a nice sort of yeah. Uh, it's a different time, and then there's uh, the psychological thing, and that's something that happens with aging as well with people who are can get pregnant. Is when you no longer get pregnant, there is a sense of freedom that you don't know. So um, mm. that was something that I found after the hysterectomy. I was like, I don't ever have to worry about mm. this because there mm-hmm. was a point in my life earlier life where don't I didn't want to get pregnant yeah then uh, we weren't planning on having children we didn't have children my husband and I but if we had a child I was with a stable partner where we yeah. had been able to figure out decisions figure out. together yeah. and and whatever that decision was would be I was really well equipped for and then single working in sex work I definitely would want to know who was the father yeah. of a baby. I use uh, condoms all the time, so I felt pretty yeah. good. Um, and uh, and things like that. And that being said, yeah. I did, I did. There was a point about forty two. I said, nope, don't want a child now. Now I'm too old mm-hmm. for me to yeah, yeah. want mm-hmm. to raise a child on my own, especially. Yeah. So 
I was like, Morena IUD. And then now that this is over, I was like, oh, this is interesting. It is changing my sex work. Um, during COVID, I worked alone and I mm -hmm. doubled down on exploring my sexuality mm, as an mm -hmm. individual, as a woman, as a 49, 51 year old. What does that look yeah. like? And I, I made it mm -hmm. a pet project. I could tell. I was like, I'm going to try different positions and I'm going to try yeah. different toys. I'm going to get out of my comfort zone. Yeah. Oh, I'm now, and I'm filming again. So what does it feel like to film with this body that has yeah. now these folds that has also these tattoos? I didn't have tattoos yeah, before. Yeah. And now I'm like, that makes me feel really sexy um, and beautiful. Mm -hmm. And my tattoos really delight me. And I, I love like your tattoos. Yeah. I love you have black tattoos them. like me. Yeah. Yeah, I love photographing them and they they pop and I'm like, I like what I did. Yeah. Oh, look, I can do this. And I yeah. was um, trying to be very accepting of this body because within my marriage, he was very uh, controlling of, of how I looked mm. because it was the it was uh, how we made our living together because we were we were co-creators of porn and mm. I had more fluctuation than he did in his body. Mm -hmm. monthly yes, <laughs> as well yes, as yeah. over years. Yeah. And it what was interesting is at one point I was on autoimmune pills because I had an autoimmune acute like episode. Mm -hmm. And so I had the, the prednisone moon face and the body boom, just boom, mm -hmm. you know, you just become very poofy and we still had to work with that. And he was understanding of that. But once I was off that, I could tell like, was like okay you got to get back to that skinny thing that everyone knew you as mm. and which is hard to do when you sustain a career over a long period of time like bodies just do change it's different if you're change. in for five years if you're in for 25 years you have to come to terms with the fact that your body changes yes and and that you're also going to want to change the body like the hair was a big thing i was known for a certain mm -hmm. haircut and i love when i see the performers and creators who just change it all up all the time. Mm -hmm. But I think that sometimes the fan base does want you to stay the same. Mm -hmm. And then there's a fan base that will loves you to be the free spirit that you are, which includes yeah. your body and your attire and your interests. Yeah. And that is really hard to navigate over. Yeah. Five yeah. plus years because you're bound to want to do something else. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, the hair. So I've just been noticing. So I had long hair like my whole life. And last year, like a year ago, maybe a little bit, year and a half ago, I cut my hair to shoulder length because I couldn't grow it long and have it look good anymore. Like it used to look really nice long and now it started to look like scraggly. And then the other day I said to PJ, I was like, I swear I have like a receding hairline. Like my hair is so much thinner. And then I was like, I don't know what's going on. And they're like, maybe you just have to have short hair from now on. And I was like, God damn it. Like why? Yeah. <laughs> well, one thing that I find strug I struggle with, with the white hair is you see my scalp more. Mm. I don't, I I'm not losing more hair. I, I, the genetics is quite, we have quite a lot of hair in the family. Um, so it's not that it's the coloring, mm -hmm. but I feel like a little exposed. I'm like, no one's supposed to see my scalp. Yeah. You know, it's funny. <laughs> it's funny. And I see it yeah. and maybe uh -huh. no one else sees it, but yeah, like I've when you start having, that, but yeah, yeah. Um, but it's going, I mean, it will thin out um, and yeah. that is normal. The other thing that thins out is your pubic hair. Mm -hmm. I did decide to grow back pubic hair in my 40s. I find I need the protection mm -hmm. and especially now post menopause mm -hmm. and without using estrogen. It's much more delicate space and the hair helps. I do not need to like have ingrown hairs or shave or yeah. like a nick is going to not heal very well yeah, yeah. now without the estrogen. And because estrogen like really keeps that area nice and plump and, and sturdy. And I was yeah. like such a, I'll be explicit. I was such a sturdy fucker before. <laughs> and I was, I could do high volume mm -hmm. and, and good intense banging there that I, I miss that. I can't do that, mm. but I have, you know, I, I, because it was great. Oh my gosh. My cat is using the litter box. No, it's fine. <laughs> Okay. It's the, so it's the I don't quiet one, but he's still, okay. Um, <laughs> we can take that one out or keep yeah. it for the, for the, for the promo. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so 
Yeah. So because, that changed your like ability. Yes. To, yeah. And, but, the, but I do now, because I do have a Bush, my fan base will say, Oh, like they are expecting a big one. And I was like, you don't know that actually you can't everybody do. over, yeah over 50 start thinning out and you start having a bald one by your, by about 75. It's pretty bald. So and do not, you, yeah. Do you, um, that's interesting because do you feel like you have to do some like education about like what I, happens to bodies? So I love doing that in general, mm-hmm. which is why I'm so glad to be here because I, I've always been fascinated by sex to, over the lifespan, comprehensive mm-hmm. sex over the lifespan. And I really consider that in like, what does adult sex ed mm-hmm. look like? And what does adult biology yeah. in education? And we, 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 and when, and it's all in this fear based, right, right. Mm-hmm. You know, eat this. You must change. You know, now metabolism, terrifying yeah. metabolism is slowing down. And rather than go, oh well, this is going to happen, and mm-hmm. some stuff mm-hmm. you can you can make some adjustments so it's a little bit easier, and you may want to or not. Like they talk about the increase yeah. in protein that is required in eating as we get older. Muscle yeah. mass is very helpful for men and women, everybody. Sure, uh, yeah. As we get into senior years. And, but your appetite changes and your sleep habits change. And so I love talking about that. Yeah. Obviously with sex work, I'm there as an entertainer. Mm-hmm. So I sprinkle it in yeah. and I do use a lot of humor, but then my writing is there for those who yeah. want a little mm-hmm. bit of deeper and possibly like now I'm going to try and shoot more TikTok videos, Instagram videos to where I can uh, find ways to talk in bite size yeah ways about this because powers your knowledge is power yeah and hearing it from a sex worker can i think it's like just another way of getting that information yeah. that they may not mm-hmm. have access to men certainly if they would have a little bit more sensitivity to the menopause experience yeah and not just go and or women just be despondent, like I'm not as young as I was, and uh, yeah, mm-hmm. you know, and 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 fear based. It's so fear based, yeah. rather than lean into. Okay, are, are you familiar with um, Joan Price? Yes, she's yes. so great. Yeah, but she's. I, I need to meet. I need to oh. meet her. I need to meet her. <laughs> I had her on Peep Show many years ago and met her at Woodhall Sexual Freedom Summit. And um, she was promoting a book at the time for listeners who don't know who she is. She is a senior who writes about senior sex and has written many books at this point. She's also written about grief because she lost a she has a book about grief because she lost a partner that she was very, very much in love with to age to age. I think she's in her late seventies now, or she's at least in her seventies. Yeah. And, um, she talks so much, like so much of her work is about sex through the lifespan. And I love like some of the work she does is about like sex toy reviews through the lens of seniors. Like, are they ergonomic (laughs) things that people who are younger don't think about? Like, which I've actually thought about because I, and I'm only, I'm turning 46 next year. So I'm still like relatively young, but I'm old enough that I didn't like, um, I, I was always like a manual masturbator. I never used any toys. I didn't really like them because I don't like, I liked the feel of, skin to skin, you know, not, um, right. And then I realized that I had to teach myself how to like vibrators because like my wrists and hands, like didn't move the way that they did before. And I like, couldn't get myself off like that anymore. And so I tried like a million vibrators and was like, I don't like this sensation. I don't like this sensation because it wasn't what my brain like wired into like pleasure. And I had to learn because otherwise I was like, well, then I just can't do it because I just couldn't do it anymore. (laughs) I think there's so much like you need to do a trial and error and, Mm -hmm. and, and do things as kind of not homework, but exercise. So for condoms, if people are like returning to a dating pool after like being a widow or something and condoms are there, there is an increase in STIs and seniors. um, Mm -hmm. And so learning to put a condom on a, on a, on a dildo. Mm-hmm. Mass as if you have a penis, masturbate with a condom on. Yeah. Practice. Mm-hmm. Try to figure out if you can re like adjust to it after being in a partnered relationship. I also yeah. think that's really useful for parents. If you have a, a kid who goes like, "I want to use condoms," how do I use them? 
if you haven't used them in 20 years because you've been in this monogamous yeah. marriage without condoms, you never used it as birth control. Like you need to, like yeah. you may or may not have that conversation, but at least you'll be yeah. prepared to mm-hmm. say, you know what? I find it's a little bit tight. And then, but I use this loop and yeah. maybe they won't say that. Maybe you won't have that relation. You don't have that relationship with kids, but at least, you know, mm-hmm. that you can be a, you know, that it's available. And I also right. think like, because I think a lot of times in, in our, house, this, a lot of times in our culture, it's just like, use condoms and that's the only thing. And not like if you're using condoms, these are the type of lubes that you can use that aren't going to mess it up. Like you, you know, there's and so then, many other things that and go then into the that. girth is not really when you have an XXL, it's usually about length and not girth. And so there are different sizes for the ring. It's harder to find, yeah. but it's possible. Yeah. Um, keep, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Keep condoms in the house so kids can steal them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, did that. I stole really makeup for my mom all the time. So <laughs> <laughs> I think if there had to be condoms, I might've done that too. Yeah, I did. I did that with my kids. I put a bowl of condoms in a place that was very obvious and just was like, but didn't, didn't say anything to them if they disappeared, like, because I want them to disappear. I want them to use them and give them to their friends if they want to, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And then it's a it's it's an empowering thing and i think talking about it and having some really uh good conversations about stis that's something that i mm-hmm. i do talk about um and i think i'm like i'm a, it can be a turn off for some fans when i talk about the practical aspects of being mm-hmm. in partnered sex work but i i'm like i'm sorry i if you yeah. if that busts the fantasy for you so much, I'm not the right person for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that That's I my have to pay attitude this amount. too. Yeah. yeah. If I pay this much for testing and I'm sorry, I can't test with that per I can't work with that person. Uh they have a different testing regimen or or something like that. Or yeah. um, because I'm in a country that is in part I'm in Canada where we don't have access to the certification of our results. Mm-hmm. That the American system. Oh, so you don't allow. use the pass system in the same way? I, uh, no, because we have legal protections of our medical data. Oh, so yeah. Those, they, so the pass and and TTS have to trust the lab. Mm-hmm. Will that I'm that it's my pee that is getting yeah. tested, not mm-hmm. like I bring in a, a friend to test for me. I mean, that could yeah. happen. So I'm sure someone has done this. They certainly oh, yeah. do it for sports. I yeah. know for sports, someone, this was and drugs job. and drug testing. Yeah. He used to, yeah. He used to have to watch people pee before mm-hmm. an athletic and do the test mm-hmm. for the athletic uh, competition. So that was his job. Yeah. That was his job to watch people do that. So they would ensure that he was, the, the athlete was giving the proper test for, for that. And then drug tests, of course. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, our system is good for my purposes. I and it's very affordable, and I can get the standard testing done, mm-hmm. not done in twenty four hours. I get the results between twenty four and depending on the, like the some tests come within twenty four hours, and some come within four or five days. The M Gen yeah. takes a while because mm-hmm. it gets shipped all the way to Vancouver for some reason. Oh, huh. there, there, there are less labs that do that testing. Yeah, it yeah. requires a, um, a very special not petri dish but like the setup it's a very unstable yeah. little test mm-hmm. so it means it, it's not done everywhere um the more you know yeah. so i do get the testing but i feel like it's it, and then i do i feel comfortable showing my partners those oh, results yeah. and i like talking about that so people can in their regular life who are not in the business right will be able to th- this one is really good it's online to get the testing, you don't have to talk to your family doctor because people don't like going to their family doctors. Mm-hmm. Um, as adults, they don't want them to know about their sex lives. I mean, it's they're not. Yeah. And if you have a doctor who's been following you for twenty five years, he's going to be he or she is going to be old. Yeah. And I find I have an old doctor, and I had she did not understand what sex work was. Not yeah. at all. Mm-hmm, I couldn't. Mm-hmm. I, she kept going. What? I don't understand. I don't <laughs> understand what you do. I don't understand. And then she finally says, "I'm going to send you to this gynecologist. <laughs> like, I am done with this conversation. I will take care of your heart mm-hmm. <laughs> and, your, your, and your thyroid, but I'm done with this." Yeah, yeah. So I can just imagine, like I, I'm, so, like I know the systems enough that I can go. It's called Teletest. Uh, ca for Ontario residents, and okay. it's a great. 
thing. You can just go in there and choose your, uh, and you have a, like a virtual visit with the doctor and then you go to a local lab and the results yeah. go all up on that website and yeah. then they get deleted uh, with, so you need to download them with oh, a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. sure they're in their servers, but like they get deleted from there. So I think that's part of the security. Yeah. 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 So what do you feel like um, has been your biggest takeaway for um, if we're going to talk about like sexuality over the ages, like over the different time spans in your life? Like, how would you characterize that development for you? That's development change mm -hmm. with no um, it's and it's there are really there are some things you can prepare for, but there, a lot of it is unexpected mm -hmm. and you have to be gentle and some of it is relationship to self is the primary mm -hmm. thing that you need to nurture i think we throw a lot onto a partner or mm -hmm. lack of partner mm -hmm. and that sexuality is yours yeah like i hope i have an erotic like i hope i feed my erotic imagination yeah and i think you should feed your erotic imagination and i yeah. think you should like I try, I went into a little bit of a reading thing at, at one point and I was like, this is fun. And, but I, I, I like mm -hmm. reading about yeah. stories and, yeah. and finding the, the niches that I like, uh, try that. And I really think men should do this. Yeah. Cis white men, well, all cis men, mm -hmm. you're not taught to have the, uh, it's like, it's taught as stress relief mm -hmm. and mm -hmm dealing with tension and like, I must do this versus let's have a dance. Let me have a dance with my body. Let me yeah. dance mm -hmm. with my imagination. Why don't I go look at other like images that inspired me? I think mm -hmm. especially as people who weren't privy to having little access, um, people who didn't have access to material because it just wasn't available. Like in the eighties, yeah, it was really hard to access explicit content. We went to a lot of mainstream content. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. think, I think, I think if you're yeah. a young person, try and do that too. Like, have a buffet, yeah. make a buffet. You're going to need it. Yeah, yeah. If yeah. you don't do it, have a buffet of experiences and fantasies and uh, material, mm -hmm. and and do that. Like, yeah, just play. Yeah. I play. love what you're saying though, about it belonging to us, because I do think that, you know, and I real I feel like I've made this mistake in my life too, of em overemphasizing, um, what like my partner is doing or thinking or relating to me and not like owning my own desires as mine. I sometimes think I've had blocks on desire. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've had like, just like the, like I could feel like I'm not, I don't, I still have trouble asking for what I want mm -hmm. on camera. So easy with a professional. So easy. Yeah. There's just the stakes are different. It's very different. It's and very I different. Love it. And mm -hmm. sometimes I feel I'm being a bit scared and lazy by making the, my professional sex life my primary sex life other than <laughs> uh -huh, sex yeah. with self sex with yeah. self is always there but yeah um and i don't mean necessarily masturbation but it's all like just the, the yeah, whole, yeah 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 like tending to it because i but i'm very open but i think sex in professional life it is different because the stakes are different but there is like, some we know that we're where we're going to want to be at the end of two yeah. to four hours with yeah. someone if it's in person or if it's on cam you right. kind of go, do you do this? Yes, I do that. No, I don't do that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And, but it, but it is like, I think like, it, it is like a play space to be, a, it could, because it is so contained to be able to be like, okay, let's spend this time doing this. That sounds awesome. And the stakes are low and for, for clients, for providers, for performers, for everybody on all sides of the different aspects of the sex industry. So. And even the, the, the customers and the viewers who are not great communicators, we can really control that we really are the boss mm -hmm. of those conversations if we want to be and but yeah you do this job long enough and you can kind of just read like the different tropes that people are coming in with based on what they're not saying yeah and so you can just go yeah that's and and 
Um, I needed to stop doing that and be, that's where the COVID bubble that I was in, which a a bubble of one um, sexually, I got to get away from other people's scripts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I needed that. So I think that that was interesting. I'm glad I did that. Mm -hmm. It was a gift I gave to myself. Yeah. Little, and I did it post hysterectomy me as well. I was like, okay, now I don't have this or this. I have a whole mm-hmm. new setup down there. It's yeah. a different, um, and be curious. And I was just like, take my time. Yeah. It's going to yeah. feel different. And it does, does feel different. It took me a little while to have orgasms. Yeah. Uh, I was terrified that I might not Yeah. have them. I was scared, but I was like also more scared of cancer. So I'll let that be the thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I wasn't scared of death as much as I thought I would be. I was really actually well prepared. I prepared myself for my surgery in mm-hmm. case anything went really bad. I was and I was like, I am loved. I'm with everybody, and I've I've done a lot with my life. I was in a really good place when yeah. I went for my surgery, and then coming out of it, I gave myself the time. Yeah, and luckily I had enough financial support, so I didn't have to return to. Yeah. I didn't have to push it, nor did I want to, because yeah. if you do. Just like you, you can cause damage if you return to insertive mm-hmm. sex after uh, C-section, mm-hmm. but and, and pregnancy, it's a different ecosystem. Yeah. Definitely, with hysterectomy, you can actually rupture. Um, yeah. stut- the, 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 and then I heard of someone who had to have reparative surgery, and I was like, nope, yeah. no reparative <laughs> surgery. If it means I am only going to be putting in a Q-tip for the rest of my life, I will only put in a Q-tip. <laughs> Because yeah. we're, like that surgery wasn't one one enough, mm-hmm. and then I was really given uh, the support by my studio manager for camming on working. Like I'm, I'm lucky that I'm a good storyteller mm-hmm. and not using a vagina, not using my vagina, yeah. when camming. So I didn't have to, and I actually it gave me an opportunity to become a better cam performer because that was yeah off the because li- you're not off rel- limits yeah. for about a month. I did a month where I was just you doing outer yeah. Yeah. sex. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think sometimes um, in, in many areas of life that limits actually open up space for a lot of creativity. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And having that, I feel like there's manifestos we can read and write mm-hmm. for about how we want to age. Because we're yeah. going to, if because it, it's, it is a gift to age. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a gift to age. Yeah. And not everyone gets the chance yeah. to have a long life. Yeah. So I want, and I want to enjoy every season of it mm-hmm. to wrap, come back to the seasons. Yeah. Of yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Full circle. I want, I want to enjoy every season. Jane Fond is like a fantastic role model or yeah. spokesperson for the seasons of, of life. And she certainly um, is someone who I find really interesting and I'm mm-hmm. glad, you know, she's part of popular culture. Yeah. Um, yeah. To tell those stories. And she's very much like, this is, I think she says she's in her fourth, right? But I think she says, I can't, I don't think she calls them error, errors or chapters. There's something else she calls them. I don't Anyhow. know, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But she has, she speaks about this, this, this last one, which is about legacy. Mm, mm-hmm. That's a good no- note to end on. Um, yeah. I like to wrap up every show with uh, three questions. So what are you reading right now? Oh my gosh, I'm like reading Discord manuals. How to do Discord. <laughs> I know it's not good at all. I mean, no, I, 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 I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I know I'm learning. I'm trying to manage this Discord. So I'm learning about Discords. Mm, and how is that going? So do you like what, it? I do like it because it's like message board, old fashioned mm-hmm. message boards, which mm-hmm. I remember. So I'm liking that. And um, a book I'm just looking at that is on the bookshelf that needs to read, which is how to do the work, which is, a, you know, a self-help type book mm, of mm-hmm. a relationship. And I, I feel like I need it in this new, like new more era. independent phase of my life, no longer a, uh, a caregiver to a parent. And I'm like, I'm an adult. I am an adult. <laughs> like that's a whole different new part of adulthood when both parents have passed on. Yeah. So, um, yeah I imagine and you were a caregiver yeah. for one of them. So like, yeah. Woo! I got to, I got to figure out how to be in relationship with other people because I feel like I've been cut off from it. Yeah. 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 What are you listening to? Okay. So one of my favorite podcasts is Peter Mansbridge, the bridge who is, he's a former anchor, the biggest, like kind of a Peter, um, not the other, what was the Peter Jennings? He's like the Mm -hmm. Peter Mansbridge is the Peter Jennings of Canada. The Peter Jennings was Canadian too. Anyways, I listened to that and really keeps me grounded in the politics of the world in a gentle, informed Mm. 
non-hyperbolic way with a very What's it called? big it's the bridge with Peter Mansbridge. Okay. And so he's he's retired from his anchor position. And then during COVID, he started doing a podcast to just bring on experts because people do enjoy him. But he's he brings in great guests. And so that's like my I my nerdy thing to listen to. Mm-hmm. Um an informative one. And then mm-hmm. music wise, I am uh I do do the Spotify. I let Spotify lead the mm-hmm. way with all kinds of nature sounds, lo-fi jazz. Mm, mm-hmm. um, I listen to a lot of stuff without lyrics. I want to get lost yeah. in, in the music. Thoughts. and Yeah. Mm, yeah, I yeah. like that. And what are you excited for? I am excited for travel this year. I'm doing a lot of it and I'm getting better at it. So I'm excited mm. to like just... And I feel finally able to probably do better networking. So I'm excited yeah. to network because I'm so shy in these social situations. <laughs> I am and too. I'm getting I'm getting better at like the pre the prep and the um knowing my limit. And then because it is much um I don't have alcohol to depend on to get yeah. me out of my bubble. And this is the first time I'm really doing it sober in new locations. Yeah. With people I don't know. And it is a big learning curve. And it was a learning curve in the past year and a half. And I think I'm going to do better. I think I'm yeah. ready to go. Hi, I'm Seska. <laughs> I've seen you online. Have I seen you online? I don't recognize. Like, I'm ready to yeah. be a little bit more out there and meet yeah. people. Um, and I want to do it. I think I, I think I, yeah. I think yeah. I'm ready. Yeah, that's yeah. great. But we should meet for coffee when we're in Miami. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so where can people find you? So my adult website is seska.com and that is a pay site. So that is adult. But if you want just to find out all my links, the real seska.com is a non-explicit link list that I run myself. Mm-hmm. So I adjust it um, as much as I can. It has a lot of different, all my social media, as well as all the both uh, professional like entertainment platforms. And I have a sub stack that I've started, uh, for long, more long form writing because I was missing it. Nice. Okay. Thank you so much. It was great to talk to you. Great to talk to you too. Thank you for joining us for another episode of when we're not hustling. I'm your host, Jesse Sage. You can find me on Twitter at sapiotextual or visit my website at jessiesage.com. The show was produced by Emily Foster. The music is by Benjamin J. Benamati. Our intern is Anna Fisher. You can follow us on socials on Instagram and Twitter at not hustling pod signing off. Have a great week.